3. Hello and welcome to my lecture on usability, which is the key word for this unit um, that we'll be covering in this class. Um, in this um, particular lecture, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to begin talking about product un usability, and then I'm going to get into document usability, which is exactly what we'll be focusing on uh, in this unit. So let's begin with what usability means. Here is what it means to enhance ease of use of technologies. Something that is usable means it is easy to use. Something that is not usable, and we've all encountered software programs and different things that we struggle with, is frequently um, not easy to use. Hence, we, we say that that is something that is not usable, and we need to make it usable. Um, so think of the word us in usability because usability is a word that applies to all of us, to regular everyday people who are non-specialists who need to learn um, a specialty or a technology. And when we talk about us, we talk about the user experience, particularly how we interface with the technologies that we use. We think of interface as something we see on the screen in front of us. I'm going to be talking about interface in a different way. I'm going to be talking about it as that nexus where the human body, the human user interfaces or connects with the technology that they're using. And when we do that, we develop a capability at using that technology. So let's go ahead and let me tell you what this is all about. So human factors engineering is a type of engineering you probably haven't heard of, but it exists as a whole field and it's something that kind of transverses all of the various engineering fields out there. And it came about um, after Na NASA started putting astronauts into space. And they discovered that um, when human beings were put in microgravity in these vaults where there was no gravity whatsoever, that their bodies would naturally go into this kind of semi-fetal position. And um, we see that here on the screen in front of you. And in this position, human beings are the most relaxed state of all. And that is because all of our joints are at the midpoint of, of their range of motions, as you can see demonstrated in, in this diagram. So human factors engineers actually study uh, the relationship between the human body and the world that they interface with, that they connect with. And they discovered that if the human body is close to this particular position in the workplace, productivity is enhanced. Fewer people go on workman's comp. Fewer people uh, get sick and ill and have aches and pains and are absent. And so what they did is they decided to, to design um, chairs and desks and computers and so on so that the human body, at least in certain jobs, would be in this, would, excuse me for a second, would be um, close to this position that they uh, discovered astronauts uh, go into um, when they're in microgravity. So human factors engineer, engineering is behind making the things that we connect with in our world when working more usable, more comfortable. So that always begins with the human body. Here we have a human hand. And the human hand has to interact with something, a product. So back in the old days, they'd make a product like this, and the human hand did not interact with it very well. Products like this did not last very long. Products like this we call uh, having a machine-centered design. In other words, the designers weren't thinking of the human body when they designed it and how users interact with it. They're thinking about the machine, how the machine can do, it can calculate. In the 70s, and especially in the 80s, as human factors engineering became a bigger thing and a, um, a broader field and, and usability specialists developed, um, products like this came about, where the actual design of the product was made with the human uh, body in mind. And we call this design a user-centered design because its design is made to interface with the body part of the human that is interacting with it. And that is a good thing. So this is an important word in this particular unit, um, prototype. Prototype means uh, like a sample um, or uh, a model that we then um, go through a number of iterations developing until we come out with a final product. 
So let's talk a little bit about prototypes. So here is a picture of a prototype. That person is Alexander Graham Bell, and that strange device he's holding is a prototype for the first telephone. Of course, it doesn't look like any telephone that we've ever seen before because it's a model. What it does kind of vaguely resemble, however, is the prototype that it was based on, which pre precedes the uh, earliest telephone, and that is the telegraph. Prior to the telephone, the telegraph was used to convey information across great distances via Morse code. And what Alexander Graham Bell wanted to do was basically replace the telegraph with a telephone, which would do the same thing. It would just use voice rather than Morse code. So the telegraph was a prototype for the telephone. The first telephones, you can kind of see the prototype of the telegraph embedded in the design if we look closely on it, at it. So here's one of the very first phones ever put out there in the world and used. And you can see it has a little uh, device here to ring up the operator. You can see that there is an earphone to hold up and a mouthpiece to speak into. But then there's this strange little contraption right here. I ask students in my class and classes, what is that for? And they all say, well, that's to um, put a beer on if we're talking on the phone or to put some food on while we're talking on the phone. In fact, that was placed there so that uh, the person using the phone could put their notepad there and collect information just like the old telegraph operator used to do because the phone was seen as conveying just information. It wasn't conceived as being a way to socially interact with people. So that's why that little desk-like protrusion is there. So you can put your notepad and collect information, just like the old telegraph operators used to do. But inevitably, users started using the telephone for social purposes. They'd pick up and say, so what's the weather like in Olean today? Uh, you know, how's the kid doing? Oh, guess what happened yesterday? And then they start leaning on that thing, or maybe putting a beer or food on it or whatever. Suddenly, the phone itself began being used outside of the original purpose, which was to convey information. It was used for social purposes, so the design of the telephone changed. Suddenly we had iterations like this, where we had a more mobile technology that you could actually hold in your hand, pick up, and move around a little bit while you were speaking on the phone. So the user's interaction with the technology shapes the evolution of that technology. Here we have an early telephone, early 20th century telephone. I'm sure we've all seen iterations of this before that you put your finger in and dial, okay? It's called a rotary phone. And if you can see the user in relation to that phone, you can see how the body of the user influenced the design of that technology. We have the earpiece there. We have the mouthpiece. We have the handle, which fits perfectly into the palm of the hand that holds it. We have a little openings to put our fingers in. This whole dimension is called the interface and it's very very important because it's where technology and user come together and that's where that's where we talk about usability and issues of usability here is a prototype for a the first one of the first um, push button telephones and as you can see it looks quite different from the push button um, keypads that we have today because the original prototype had two rows of five keys each but one thing that they did with this particular prototype was they actually tested it using users, uh, with users. And many of the people who participated in this user testing said, you know, I don't like how it feels on my hand. So they designed, they redesigned the keyboard and they developed this kind of universal design which exists all over the world of three, of, um, three rows, three keys each and the little operator key at the bottom. And that is something that more people felt was more uh, interface better with the hands of the people who operated it. So uh, as time went on, telephones took on various designs that represented a variety of people, of users of different ages, even the environments and the social situations um, that those users were in. So there's been quite an evolution um, in the design of technology from this to that. And um, I just want to point out that that evolution was advanced because of the people's interactions with it, the users themselves, not because some brilliant engineers kept coming up with new design plans out there. That's kind of a myth. It's actually the people who use it that influence the design of the technologies. Now let's look at cellular phones for a second here because this is important as well. And April 3rd, 1973, this guy that you see on the screen in front of you, Martin Cooper, picked up 
the first cellular phone and made the first cellular telephone call to a rival engineer at another company and said, guess what? I am calling you on a cellular telephone. And that rival engineer was not too happy uh, about what he heard because several engineers at different companies were working on this technology. And Martin Cooper here uh, at Motorola was the first one to make the first cellular telephone call. Anyway, um, these phones, it was not until the early 80s before they were actually marketed. And um, I wonder, uh, do you have any idea how much one of these phones cost when it first came out in the, 19, in the early 1980s? I'll tell you, $3,500. So in the very, very, very early years of um, the cell phone, only very rich people, like the character from Wall Street played by Michael Douglas, this is a 1980s movie, had phones like this. And this is the first time I ever saw a cell phone or a mobile phone in use was in the hands of a very rich person who could afford it. But then um, something happened. During the 1980s, as we can see from this chart, household net worth went down. And it was actually uh, a time of, it was a time of great prosperity for some people in our culture. But generally speaking, at the level of the individual, uh, income levels went down and household net worth went down during that time when um, cell phone technology came out, uh, came into being. But then in the 1990s, uh, there was an uptake as we can see from this chart. And um, more people had money, and also the uh, and various markets were deregulated, including the telecommunications markets during the 1990s. And so a variety of um, telephone companies got in on developing networks and um, cell phones and marketing, marketing them to regular consumers, to us, the regular users out there, people who could buy them. So prices came down, and as a result, we all, we all have um, cell phones. Well, not all of us, but many of us have cell phones and smartphones today. Um, but still, even as phones became more, more mobile and more light, there still were problems. Here we have a picture of some very important people, stockbrokers, who handle um, the wealth of so many of us out there. And look at the guy down um, uh, at the very left here. Uh, well, I guess I should say the very right if you're looking at this picture. Um, he doesn't look too happy. And look what he's done here to keep the phone up. He's created that kind of a contraption so that he can hold the phone on his shoulder uh, while using it, uh, while using other phones. And this is not a good thing because a stockbroker with a lot of aches and pains may not be in a good mood and may make mistakes with our money. So we don't want that to happen. We also don't want people walking around like this because it just can give you a headache, literally. And if they're important people, we don't want them to be uh, in, a, in a constant state of discomfort. So human factors engineers come in and they look at the system and they say, well, let's develop headsets like this. And so as a result of human factors engineering, or what we call usability specialists these days, we have um, even more mobile, mobile technologies than what we had before. And so there's a lot of more happy people out there. So as you can see, the users really matter in the development of these products. And that was my basic point uh, I want to make in this, that even that when we look at various technologies like the telephone and even the cell phones, we see that the, the uh, evolution of this technology is the result of um, trying, to be, trying to accommodate the people who use it, um, going from very large and bulky to very small and pocket size, so that people will want to buy these products and use these products on a continual basis. So, I just talked about product usability, and I think I'm making pretty good time here. Now I want to talk about document usability, which is what we'll be focusing on most um, in this particular unit. So this is very important that you pay attention to this lecture from here on out. So um, what we'll be developing in this um, unit is basically a multimedia package that is um, that traditionally has been called instructional literature. Today it's called task-oriented information. And um, basically, when we look at operator manuals and appliance directions and how-to guides, or what I'm going to call user guides, these are like the kind of the forefront of this type of instructional literature or task-oriented information, these kinds of publications. And so let's take a look at the history and development of user guides, shall we? Because it's relevant to what you'll be doing in this particular unit. Here we have um, a page from a, uh, from a user guide, Operating Instructions. Um, from, I believe, the 1950s. And just look at the design of this document. We see here it has says section Roman numeral 2, um, and then we uh, have uh, 
the title up there. Basically, we're learning how to use this device here. So there's a lot of text on this page, and the writing uh, and the design and the format of this text is interesting to look at. Let's blow out a small section right here. So here we have a section called Two Four Controls. It's divided into section A, subsections A, B, and C. Look at the section A called General, and let's read this out loud right now. This paragraph furnishes the operator with sufficient information about various controls for proper operation of the gasoline burning stove. All right, this is very wordy and cumbersome prose. It also speaks about us, the user, in third person. It talks about the operator. And just the whole format of it, A, B, C, it just seems a little bit like overkill, especially compared to user manuals that we have today. Why is that? Because back in these days, we didn't have human factors engineers, and we didn't have technical writers and technical communicators. So these directions were written basically by the engineers who developed the products. So the engineers wrote like engineers did in those days. This is how engineers communicated. They tended to write in verbose um very overly formatted ways in third person. And it's so it doesn't have a usable feel when we read this. It's like an engineer writing for other engineers. And we don't want to blame engineers because this is how engineers document and format their writing. Take a look at th this example here. Roman numerals and letters. Um, and this is from uh, and this is from a template for uh, from 2013 for um, uh, engineering journals. So uh, what we see is engineers writing for other engineers, and they weren't particularly usable back in those days. Let's look at um, the 1936 Cord automobile, um, which was an automobile that was popular in the United States for just two years. Then it became unpopular, and I believe that's probably because the owner's manual is so cumbersome to read. Here's one page from that um, owner's manual. Just look at the illustration here. This is not what you see when you open up the hood and look in the engine of your car. This is what an engineer sees as he or she designs um, the, a certain uh, part of that engine. They look at it as a cross section and this is something that, again, it represents what the engineer values but not what the user values when trying to navigate his or her way through dealing with the engine of their, of their, um, of their uh, model of this car here. Take a look at this um, user manual for a uh, motorcycle that was popular in the 50s in the UK. It's a German motorcycle, but it was popular in the United States and the United Kingdom in the 1950s. Here's what the first few pages of that user manual looks like. And um, we open it up to pages 22 through 23, and it reads like a Dostoevsky novel with a picture on it. And back in those days, people were quite literate. And so reading directions and kind of picturing processes in their minds um, wasn't hard to do. But times have changed. Let's look at one paragraph here. Let's read this out loud. To test the efficiency of the brake when applied, place the machine on the stand and get someone to press the crank backwards. Hold the tire at the bottom of the wheel and pull the wheel towards you in an attempt to rotate it. If and uh, if, with even considerable pressure on the crank, the wheel can still be turned, your dealer should be informed of this so that he may inspect it and rectify it. Okay, these days people don't have quite that attention span to picture all of this in their mind. They want to kind of see um, what is being described here in prose um, visually demonstrated. So times have really, really changed, and these old user guides really don't speak to the generations of people brought up with a lot of social media and a lot of visual stimulation stimulation that we have today. So we have to look at the design of documents very differently, and so we have to take what's called a user-centered approach to the design of documents that we make for the people that we get provide instructions for. And... Um, User-centered design uh, really became big in the 1990s with the introduction of, I'm sure you've all seen the series of books, the Four Dummies books. As you can see right there on the front page at the bottom, it says, A Reference for the Rest of Us, an acknowledgement that so many user guides at that time just didn't really appeal to common, everyday, average people like us. So these Four Dummies series came out and began to make complex or specialized technical operations 
more usable, more understandable, so that we would feel comfortable learning how to do certain things. Take a look at one page from one of these, right off the bat. Look at the title, jumping right in, and the subtitle, First Things First, okay? Um, these, this is a very informal spoken language that we immediately feel like someone's speaking to us as we, um, as we, as we read it on the page in front of us here. Look at um, the first person pronoun I is used here, as well as you. Even contractions are used. So we feel like the writer is actually speaking to us, addressing us in a conversation um, in a user-friendly or, or reader-friendly tone of voice, which makes us feel a little bit more engaged when trying to learn complex technology. Um, Back in the uh, early 90s, I think it was the early 90s, or maybe it was the mid-90s when this book came out, um, Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. It's, you can see here, a common sense approach to web usability. Um, this had a huge impact on, um, on human factors engineers and on usability specialists um, because it argued that basically when we design a web page or when we design any product, and this includes writing, it, we shouldn't require too much thought um, on the part of the reader or the user. And if we do, we're failing in our ability to communicate how to perform a certain operation. So you look at the left here, that's good. Where you see something, you're looking for a job and you see a button that says jobs, you click it. Whereas you look at the right, it says this requires thought. Hmm, because it says what? job o -rama. We're not really sure, so we have to stop and sort of figure it out. He says that's not bad. We ha it should be more instinctual and intuitive how we interface with the technology. Same here. At the far left, we have a button that looks like a button because it has that three-dimensional raised quality to it, whereas on the right, we don't have that. We just have the word results and a triangle pointing to it. So it stop makes us stop and think, is that a button? Not good. We have to be a little bit more fast-paced and intuitive. That's the style of communicating information these days. Now, we can go very far, like this, these particular directions do, and take out all the words completely and just put in visuals that instruct us in how to, do, how to perform a certain operation. That's fine for many people, but there are also people out there who do need to have some text who are what we call verbal linguistic learners, and this may not really do it for them. So it's best to always strive for a kind of a combination like standard user guides do these days. If you look at um, the image here on your screen, you can see that there are a number of steps and they're listed one, two, three, and they're um, all blue and they are all round and they are all um, the same color. And you can see that the page um, has both visual information and textual information, and both are equal. It's not like there's more writing than visual information on this page. The visual information matters. We look, we read, we learn at the same time. It's not just reading, it's not just looking. It's bringing those two together so there's a symbiotic correspondence between what is described in writing and what is visually demonstrated right next to it on the page. Um, so here is a, here's directions, step one, step two, step three, that are very clear and very easy to read. Um, however, not everybody would respond well to this because we're not all um, verbal linguistic learners. Some of us are more visual and oral learners. So let's just complement it by putting some visuals in there. So now, a wide variety of people with different learning styles can follow the directions here. We have text-based directions for people who respond well to that, as well as more visual-based directions for people who respond well to that. That's a usable type of document according to today's world that we live in. Here we have another image from um, iPhone, uh, from the I, uh, user guide for the iPhone um, 6. And just look over here on one page. You see we actually have the human body represented. Um, we see two fingers um, here that are described in writing, and they are uh, moving, they are swiping uh, an image to make it larger on the iPhone, and you see indicator marks there, the little arrows that point out that, that those fingers are in motion. And so the human body and that kind of tactile um, connection that we have when we interface with technology is still represented here, even in print. This particular book won an award for usability several years ago, 
All you do is, all you have to do is take your cell phone out, put it in this cutout in the middle of the book, and then turn the pages. And these little pointed fingers and arrows would then point to places on the interface and explain them. Notice how little writing is in, or, uh, appears on the pages here. That's because technical writing is kind of going the way of technical communication. Uh, it's not just writing that communicates technical information anymore. Now let me end um, this whole uh, lecture with a discussion uh, briefly, uh, an example of why I think document usability and document design is so very, very important. Um, here is a picture of me um, taken several years ago when I was getting my PhD at Michigan Technological University. Um, I was elected president of the graduate student government and there I am right there on the website at that particular time. So when I came in as graduate student government, I wanted to do things differently and, and, and do some new things. So one thing that I did that, I, that worked out quite well is um, I put up videos on our YouTube channel in which I would ha answer questions about certain issues like the new parking fee increase at Michigan Tech in, in 2012. My PR um, chair would ask me these questions and I would answer them. And that was a lot more engaging for people to actually go and watch the video rather than just read a long email explaining all the details about the new track, um, parking fee. One question that I was asked quite a bit was, why did you put these subtitles underneath? We can hear you. We can, we can understand what you're saying. Why did you put those subtitles in there? And my answer was this. First of all, there are people who are um, deaf. Um, who, are who are part of the graduate student population. And even though they may be a very, very small minority, they do matter and I want them to be able to follow along as well. Secondly, half of my constituents, more than half in fact, of the graduate students at Michigan Tech um, speak English as a second language. So many of them come from India and China and these other countries and um, they do not have the same level of listening proficiency as native speakers do because we speak so fast and we use a lot of slang. So I put subtitles in so that it would be more usable for this particular segment of the population. So I'm thinking about the needs and sensibilities of my users as I made these videos. And then one more thing that I think is really important is this. Um, we had the graduate student government um, sponsored every year a graduate research colloquium. And here are pictures from the one that we sponsored in 2013, right here. Um, a graduate research colloquium looks something like this. When you have um, a bunch of people um, that come and display posters, students display posters of research projects that they've undertaken in their classes to faculty and other students and judges and so on. So one big problem for our graduate research colloquium was this. No one was there except the presenter and the judges. And only about 30 people participated year after year after year. It was a dead zone. It was a bomb. And I wanted to change that. So what I did is I said, how do I change it? I need to find out, first of all, why so few people are participating in this graduate research colloquium. So I went to our website, which is, this is what it looked like at the time. And I said, I'm going to enter as a graduate student and see what happens. So I went here and clicked that little link where it said, submit your properly formatted abstract of your research presentation. So all people who wanted to participate in this graduate research colloquium had to do this in order to be able to come and participate in the colloquium. So I clicked that and look what opened up. A PDF with a lot of words on it. Not only that, a lot of bullets. If you want to count up these bullets, go ahead. But I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of them. In fact, there are 26 bullets on this page. Everything is in text. And I think a lot of graduate students went, opened this up, saw all this text and all these bullets and said, eh, you know, I don't have time for this. Forget it. I'm not going to do it. So what I did is I replaced this document with a more usable one. So I took this one, got rid of it, and I developed this one here. Look at how many bullets are on this one. You can see, you can count them easily, only four. And what I attempted to do is in the old document, what I took was all of those bullets and I just converted that into a visual that basically showed students what they had to do. And as a result of making this document more usable, we had more than 100, I think it was like 115 
um, people uh, come and participate in that graduate research colloquium is a huge success and it's gotten better and better and better. And it all really comes down to the usability of a single PDF. So that's why document design really, really does matter um, when we are dealing with the public and especially when we're trying to provide instructions on how to do something. So to kind of end things up, uh, end things now in this lecture. Whenever, again, this is something I've said before, but whenever you um, read anything, pay attention to the design and to the writing of it because we really, it really does matter. It's not just what we write, it's um, how a document looks to us frequently and how, uh, how that look um, makes us want to read and engage that matters. This is an article that is in columns with images and it's very, very different from this article that is in columns with images and this article, which is in columns and images, as well as that one, as well as that one. All of these very different articles, we can just see they're different by looking at them, looking at them generally have different uh, targeted audiences, different readers, or a certain demographic of, ye of readers that they're appealing to. Therefore, we want our design as well as our writing style to engage that specific demographic or population of users that we're striving to connect with. So we need to do that. Here's my last slide, by the way, by doing a quick assessment of the people that we're designing documents for by asking a bunch of simple questions. First of all, who's your target audience? That's something that you're going to be thinking about in this particular unit. You will have a target audience that you need to design documents for. Who are they? And what are their needs and expectations? That's the next question you should ask. And then, how should my writing style feel to them, to that particular audience? How should my document look to them? How should my visual items appear to them? And finally, how should my soundtrack sound to them? When you answer these questions, you're thinking about the user. You're not thinking about just a document, about just instructions. You're thinking about the people that will be using it, and that really, really, really matters. So that concludes my lecture um, for this unit. That uh, Basically, this lecture it provides a kind of general real-world overview um, for what this unit will be focusing on. Um, thank you very much uh, for watching. I appreciate it. We'll see you online.